Hello, everyone, and welcome to our April Coast to Coast meeting. Today, we have Dr. Richard Wassersack and Dr. Lauren Walker here as guest speakers. Thank you to you both for giving a presentation today, and thank you to all who have joined this meeting. Before we get started, I'll go over a bit of housekeeping. Mics will be muted during our presentation, but please feel free to send questions via the chat should anything come up during the presentation. A couple of reminders, support group meetings are strictly confidential and any personal information that is shared here today should not be shared outside of this group. The first portion of our meeting will be recorded to share with others who are not able to attend today, but the recording will be shut off following the presentation to encourage free and open discussion, as well as to protect the privacy of all participants. As a reminder as well, that the facilitators, moderators, and participants today do not provide medical advice. For example, it's okay for our participant to speak about their experiences with a specific treatment, but our participant should not suggest a treatment, medication, or medical procedure to another participant. The opinions and information that are shared at these meetings do not replace the advice of a medical professional. Following the presentation portion of the meeting, there will be time for a Q&A period. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand using the raise your hand function on Zoom, which can be found either under reactions or participants on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, depending on the device, the device you are joining us on today. When you press the raise your hand function, we will see that you have a question and call on you to unmute yourself to ask the question. I will now move on to the intros. So Dr. Richard Wassersack is a PhD research scientist and co-lead of the National ADT Education Program, which you can see on lifeonadt.com. He is also the lead author on the book, Androgen Deprivation Therapy, an essential guide for prostate cancer patients and their loved ones. Richard has co-authored with psychologists and oncologists over 20 peer-reviewed research papers relevant to the quality of life of prostate cancer patients. We are lucky to have the co-lead of the project, Dr. Lauren Walker here with us today. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Richard and he will start his presentation and also introduce Dr. Walker. Okay, uh, can you see my slides at this point? And can you hear me? Yeah. Right. So I want to say a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, I'm the I'm the, the first author on this on the book on androgen deprivation therapy. Lauren Walker is the second author, and she's I'm honored she's a, was able to join us and me today to present this because it's really built upon her PhD work that we got this program uh, going in the first place. And uh, although I'm going to be doing the major talk at the front end. I'm inviting Lauren to be unmuted um, and uh, be free to cut in and embellish and add on uh, to whatever I say. Um, she's a clinical psychologist uh, and a, a fabulous collaborator. And this ADT educational program that we co-run would not exist without her both uh, managing the program, really, and uh, contributing it to its design and its intellectual uh, capability. And she's going to stay on to up at least to the, the top of the hour. Uh, to be able to answer any questions that any of you have. Okay, so this is not a, our standard class that we might offer on, on how to manage ADT side effects. It's a class for everybody, for any patients anywhere um, we're gonna, who might, might or might not be on ADT, um, but the sort of general things that every patient ought to know whether they're on or not. And I'm gonna go over to presenter mode here um, as a, uh, to, uh, uh, oh, there we go. All right. Whoops. Let's got to get that to work. Okay. So we, Dr. Wasser, Sug, and, and Walker, we're, we're both not MDs, we're PhDs, are co-leads for the National ADT Educational Program here in Canada, which is currently funded by unrestricted grants from the following organizations. Now, we're not promoting their products. They're not legally allowed to do that. In fact, they have to make sure that what we do does not promote their products. So this isn't uh, there, but they fund us enough so that we can offer this class and give free copies of the book uh, uh, on ADT uh, to uh, patients who take the class. Uh, so they are important sponsors and uh, and uh, we're, we're grateful for that support. I've got a couple of points to cover in this talk. Whether one is on ADT, which most people know as hormonal therapy, or not, there are some basic points that every prostate cancer patient, I'll abbreviate that PCA, should be aware of. And our goal is to cover these in four groups. First, what are the basic problems of maintaining a good quality of life while on ADT? Two, what can patients do to minimize those problems? Three, how does ADT impact not just patients, 
but their loved ones. And that's an important point, which I'll give some time to in the talk. And lastly, where to start to manage the adverse effects of ADT. So I'll dig right in with some general backgrounds. With increased awareness of prostate cancer and PSA screening, men are increasingly diagnosed, treated, and cured of the disease when they are largely asymptomatic. As such, any long-term suffering they experience is more likely from the side effects of the treatment rather than from the disease. So somebody must said, I think the doctor told me I have a cancer and I had no symptoms. That's typical. That's common with prostate cancer. If people are getting PSA screening and uh, get a, bi a biopsy at, a, at an early enough stage. But then they, if they're going on to treatments, they have to deal with the side effects of the treatments. Approximately half of all men treated for prostate cancer will be on androgen deprivation therapy, which I'll abbreviate as ADT or hormonal therapy, at some time in their life. That alone is a good enough reason for every patient to know a bit about ADT. So I know that several of you run support groups, you if, uh, are, are, are really deeply engaged with uh, not just your own situation, but with other prostate cancer patients. And just because um, it's used so often, AD, uh, hormonal therapy, you know, it's used in two situations. It's used to improve the, efficacy, the efficiency of radiation therapy, and it's used long-term when the disease has spread beyond the gland or where the gland used to be. So half of all men at one point or another will be on ADT, either short-term or long-term. However, there are problems with it. And right off, even the names, hormonal therapy is vague. Androgen deprivation therapy is technical and calling it chemical castration is scary. So we don't have a really good name for it. And both MDs, doctors and patients tend to avoid the word castration. Although in the literature, one talks about um, uh, castration resistant prostate cancer. Um, so that's in the literature and used all the time. And, uh, but there's a stigma associated with that language. There's no way around that. Although the terms above mean the same thing, patients understand them differently. And uh, in an online survey of men, significantly fewer said they would accept chemical castration than hormonal therapy to treat prostate cancer if recommended by their physicians, even though it's the same thing. So right off the top, one of the problems is the language alone discourages discussion about ADT. So often I can file, talk to a prostate cancer patient, and it will take a while before it even comes out that they've ever been on ADT. We typically don't talk about it. And by the way, I said we, because I am, for those who don't know this, a prostate cancer patient myself, and I have been on versions of ADT almost continuously for over 20 years. And the paper that looked at the language there is cited at the bottom. Those were two of my students that worked on that paper with me. Okay, the prevalence of ADT. Between short and long-term use, about 600,000 men in North America are on ADT at any one time. The numbers are comparable to Europe. Now, there's been a push towards active surveillance and intermittent use of ADT, which has led to a slight decline in ADT use in Canada, at least. However, because of earlier detection, prostate cancer patients are now starting an ADT at a younger age than in previous years, and some PCA patients diagnosed early may now be on and off of ADT for 20 plus years. And the record, I think I've heard of a patient who had been treated um, and uh, didn't and, uh, seemed to have be essentially cured. It was 27 years when the PSA started climbing again. So that can happen. Of course, what that means is we, as, as prostate cancer patients, are going to be getting PSA tests for the rest of our lives. Now, this is technical, the next two slides, but this is the, the, just to mention the, 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 the drugs and the categories of drugs that we're inv involved with. And primarily it is drugs, but there are other, other there are a surgical approach, approach to androgen deprivation therapy. So what is the formal? The formal forms are typically chemically castrating drugs with re largely reversible effects if one comes off the drugs on short term. Uh, and the, the main ones we use are have the fancy complicated name of luteinizing hormone releasing hormone agonists. Most of us know that is either luperolide, as Lupron or Elgar or Groserolin which is uh, the, the, the marketed name is Zolodex. And those are the most common drugs we use. Now, they were often, we start patients, typically my colleagues, my, my MD colleagues, start patients with an antiandrogen, which can be given as monotherapy. It's used in some parts of Europe that way, typically not in Canada because it's not been shown to be that effective. But that is that drug that's often used for patient, patients are starting on these drugs short-term is uh, the common name is biclutamide. The market name is Casadex. However, there's a, another group of drugs 
uh, that uh, can be used. They do the same thing of crashing our production of testosterone. Um, and uh, they are luteinizing hormone releasing antagonists. Uh, they, they have a different chemical pathway, but the result is the same. They shut off the signal from the brain to the testicles to produce testosterone. So therefore we are androgen deprived and that's where we get the name, androgen deprivation therapy. And there are also other uh, uh, compounds like non-oral estrogens that can be used to uh, shut down the production of testosterone. But traditionally and originally, it was surgical castration. And it was a Canadian, Charles Huggins, who got the Nobel Prize for castrating men and extending their lives. Uh, he then went on to using drugs because uh, the surgery is not reversible, but the drugs can be. But nevertheless, those are all forms, primary forms of ADT. But that's only half the story. That's what I might have given like five years ago. Now we have additional things to layer in here. There's what's now being called hormonal intensification, and it is increasingly common with what we are called androgen receptor targeted agents, or ARTAs. There's other names as well. They're also all more commonly, commonly called, not necessarily more commonly called, RC. As I said, there's multiple names. So these are androgen receptor targeting agents such as abiraterone, or Zytiga, and second generation antiandrogens. Uh, antiandrogens are drugs that attach to the receptors on cells and block the, the ability of testosterone to activate those cells. Uh, and uh, uh, Casadex was an early one, but now we have three uh, more powerful newer ones, Extandi, Erlita, and Nubeca with their scientific names behind there. And we can add in chemotherapy as new combinations. And in fact, uh, one term that I love is androgen annihilation. So if ADT was androgen deprivation, if you take ADT plus Cytiga, you block any production of androgens within the body uh, under normal circumstances. So it's androgen annihilation, much stronger. So we have these all these combinations that intensify the effectiveness of these drugs. But, okay, I'll say, uh, as patients go on them, they're uh, increasingly using these drugs in combination with ADT, we have a new problem. And that is, we intensify the side effects. All right, now I'll come back to that, but here's just a list of the side effects, the primary best known side effects from ADT. I won't read off the whole list. I'll give you a second to look at it though. And it's extensive. There's a, things that affect us emotionally, like hot flashes. There are risks to uh, like osteoporosis, which means weaker bones and so forth. Some of these things, if you look on the right-hand side, increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, this is serious stuff that we would not necessarily ex experience until perhaps a crisis uh, develops or we, a, the doctors watch it with blood tests uh, to look for markers for these risks. But others are the ones that we will experience and they may, may or may not be serious. So here now I'll shift over to blue. And these are sort of the ones that we will personally experience, erectile dysfunction, hot flashes, loss, loss, loss of sexual interest, genital shrinkage, Gynecomastia refers to dress, breast development, and that varies depending on what drugs are used uh, and one's body weight and so forth. Possible impairment of memory and attention, that's very variable, but there's more and more papers suggesting a risk there. Fatigue, that we certainly experience. Increased emotionality, uh, is often exemplified by tearfulness. And stress and loss of identifiers of simple sort of embodied markers of masculinity, such as loss of body hair. Now, I'm on these drugs now. I do not lose my facial hair. I do not have hair in my arms and my chest, though, because that is what, that's lost when you're on these drugs. Now, these side effects can result in serious challenges to maintaining a good quality of life while on ADT. So that, that's the background for our interest here. We know that these drugs have a lot of side effects, that some of them are dangerous, some affect our quality of life and our own experiences right, on the, right up front. And therefore, we are interested in what we as patients can do to manage or minimize these side effects. Now, in order to manage the side effects of ADT, patients and their partners, and I will come back to the issue about the partners, need to know what are the adverse effects of these drugs. So if you're going to say, oh, we, you know, there's ways to manage these side effects, you need to know what they are. All right. So one of the earliest things, and again, Lauren, my co-lead here, gets the credit for doing the initial research here, and that is to explore how well-informed our patients about the side effects of ADT. 
And uh, she took the lead on this and uh, did a survey of both patients and partners uh, who had gone for a consult to start on these drugs. So they, these are the doctors, they're going to be talking with the doctors who are starting on these medications. Now, the doctors may have a half hour, they may have 40 minutes, in some cases, they may only have 20 minutes. Uh, and then we asked them afterward, or what Lauren did, you know, how many of these side effects do you know? Now, that lists virtually all that, are, that were on that earlier slide. But you can see, if I look at the left there, hot flashes, lost libido, impotence, that is a loss of erection or loss of sexual desire, fatigue, possible risk of, of breast development, genital shrinkage, weight gain. So that's a serious one. Weight gain is fat, not as muscle. But you'll see... Um, a few lines over to the right, reduced muscle mass. So that's a really big hit. We go well, on these drugs, one's going to gain weight as fat. If they don't do anything about it, lose weight, lose muscle mass. And that's going to add to fatigue and so forth. Now, if you look at the percentages, that's what this, uh, these, the y-axis is. Uh, hot flashes, most of them heard, heard about that. When you look at the sexual function, it gets down to about 60%. And then you get down and you'll notice that, but here's about 50%. And only about half of the people who have been on the consult starting these drugs knew about one third of the side effects. Okay. It's about 40 to 50%. But by the time you get down to changes in emotion, risk of depression, loss of body hair, it drops down. And anemia, we now know is really a serious problem, yet less than less than 10% of the patients. Now, this study is a little bit, you know, about a, I guess, Lauren, you can nod at about 10 years old now, I think. But, it's a, but it shows that the patients are not, even right when they come out of their, the, uh, the interview or shortly thereafter, are not well informed about the side effects. Okay? Here's an interesting and fascinating point. The patients were significantly more aware than their partners of the sexual side effects of ADT, such as the impact on genital size. The partners were significantly more aware that the impact of the drugs on the patients could affect their mood and how they interacted with other people. So that's profound. They were at the same conference. They were at the same, same access, the same information. And there's the reference at the bottom. Uh, patients and partners lack knowledge of ADT therapy side effects. So it's going to be a challenge to help them manage the side effects if they're not informed of the side effects. And this is and the, the difference between patients and partners as despite them having attended the same information session with the same prescribing physician. So there's either the doctors don't have enough time, they decide that some of the side effects are too minor to be a major, you know, to be a concern to worry the patients about because they may have no, no medical implications. Uh, the patients are so freaked out, or the partners are, that they're not hearing at all. But this, uh, this documents a real serious problem with information. Now, this shows that patients and their partners may have different concerns about how ADT is affecting the patient in their relationship. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So we're saying the patients have a problem, but even the pe people who are they're closest to, who went to the consult, say, with them, it might not be their, their partner, maybe their, their kids or something. But if there was somebody, they're not even picking up all the information when they were both hearing it at the same time. Faced with how the ADT, this is getting into the, uh, the implications of these drugs on not us alone, but on our partners and why we need to be concerned about that. Faced with how ADT affects them, many us, that many men withdraw their affection from and physical contact with their partners. So I'll just elaborate a little bit of that. We typically have a bit of a sex drive normally, and we recognize and appreciate our partners, right? If we lose that sex drive and, and we start to ignore our partner, then and we don't even touch them, then they can feel abandoned. That is that may seem like well, you know, I, I didn't touch her, but I'm, and I'm not that inter interested. We may we may minimize this, but it's not minimal because it has real big implications. We may be embarrassed by the changes that we're experiencing. So a lot of men say, I don't feel like myself. I and we can be angry, whatever. But if we don't feel like ourselves but can't explain it and don't know what's going on because we didn't realize it was an effect of the drugs, uh, we may be reluctant to discuss them with our partners, which can lead to depression and frustration in the partners. Serious stuff there. And that, uh, this is a paper published in 2005 by a, a, a social worker who works with the patients and her, and her husband, who is a urologist. But this has been documented in several ways by several other researchers since then. Now, there's a cost to the partners, and I do sneak this in every talk I ever give in these two slides. Studies going back 
1994, okay, we're getting close to 30 years, show that the psychological distress on the partners of prostate cancer patients on ADT is even greater than on the patients themselves. And it is not necessarily withdrawal of intimacy, or it's withdrawal of intimacy, that is contact or a discussion or just talking, not necessarily loss of sex, sex acts, you know, coital sex. That seems to be the biggest problem. Um, okay, so that is the patients are not communicating, possibly because they don't know how to express what's happening. And now the partners are taking a hit. And I think so, I know several of you uh, by are on the same support group and uh, chat lists. And I can tell you, if you're following some of the advanced chat list groups, you'll see these letters from the partners and these postings about how terrible, how miserable he is, and I don't know what to do about it. And the crisis with the partners is emotionally as bad for the patients. I'm lingering on these two slides because there's even another part of this story. Loss of intimacy can harm, not, can harm both the patients and the partners. This feedback here, and this is profound. So this is lib language. I put it in my talks, even when I'm talking to doctors, I've had nobody challenge me on it. ADD causes a communicable. We have a problem. Now she's got the problem. If we're talking, by the way, I say she, because the data that are historical here are all from uh, heterosexual couples. We don't have data on same-sex couples. But we have a communicable, that is we pass it on to our partner. Iatrogenic, that means it's caused by the doctor. He gave us the drug and we started us the drug. Psychiatric. We're, we're uh, happy, confused, emotionally um, experiencing a shift in how we felt before, and it's communicable disorder. And here's the catch line. Distress in the partners correlates with distress in patients. Name of there is, and this is a quote from a paper, evidence of partner effects, at least for women. That is, women's distress predicts men's physical health over and above the men's distress age and cancer stage. That means if she's really distressed, she knows that we are, but she knows, uh, I'm using, again, she, because we don't have same-sex data, but she recognizes how bad we are, and she can predict that she's, if she's lived with us for 30 years, she has a better way of reading us by far than our physicians who may see us you know, briefly uh, a few times a year. And that paper goes back to 2008. So we have to worry about not only do, what do we as patients know, we have to not worry about what do our partners know. We have to worry about the possibility that they know different things than we do. And we have to worry about their distress as well as ours. These are basic things that I feel everyone needs to know. So if you're concerned about ADT might be affecting you as a patient, us as patients, you might also be concerned about how it might affect those close to you. And it doesn't have to be necessarily partners. It can be the kids. It can be your, next, your, your neighbors, your friends you normally hang with. But there's imp implications to being on these drugs that go beyond just our patient, us ourselves as patients. There is a need not only for educating patients about ADT side effects and how to manage them, but also we need to educate their partners and loved ones. So as you under, heard earlier, we run uh, classes for patients, but most assuredly they're for patients and their loved ones. They're always open to come to the classes. So what are the two best things that one can do to manage ADT side effects? And so now normally when we give a class, we spend 40 minutes going through all the things you do to manage the side effects sort of one by one. Okay, hold on. One of them is clearly to be educated about them ahead of time. And once again, Lauren took the lead on this. She's the researcher here uh, uh, and did, and this was her PhD thesis work. She did a randomized controlled trial where we gave uh, educational programs to patients when they were starting these drugs and then six months later when they had their, first, you know, were getting into the side effects. And without a doubt, Patients were uh, statistically significantly more felt more capable of managing the side effects. Now, that doesn't mean if educating about uh, hot flashes means that you won't have them. What it means is that if you know there's ways to manage them, then you're less stressed and you can, and you can manage them, even if you don't have to use all those methods. So being educated ahead of time, by, and it's been shown by a randomized control trial that it can improve, improves patients, and the correct term here is self-efficacy in managing the side effects. So there's a real need. And now again, not all of you are necessarily on ADT, but if you have support groups and you hear about somebody who's going on these drugs or being considered going on these drugs, number one, I have two things, but number one is get educated. Number two is stay fit. Because if you go back to the med medical side effects, the risk of diabetes, the risk of, of, of uh, depression, 
the risk of losing muscle mass, the risk of fatigue. One study after another, these are coming out almost a paper a week now, reporting on the benefits of physical exercise for managing more advanced treatments for cancers in general, but most assuredly for ADT. And now I'm going to have one summary slide here. Uh, that is, uh, one really, really wants to exercise. And I do have a rant that I give to prostate cancer support groups. If you are in a support group, you guys start exercising. Do something. Go to walk to the coffee shop a few blocks away or whatever. But add to your program, just not inf just information dumps from people like me or Lauren or whatever, but add some exercise. Why? Because it helps main maintain muscle and muscle strength. It helps keep weight under prop properly control because these drugs cause us to increase body weight as fat. It helps reduce the risk of depression. Absolutely. That's well documented in multiple studies. Helps preserve bone strength, if it particularly impact loading of the skeleton. Helps reduce falling and breaking bones. So we have to worry about these drugs can cause uh, weaker bones, but they also increase the risk of falling because you're probably weakening the small muscles that help us maintain balance. And if we fall, we have an increased risk of breaking a bone. And if it happens to be our hip, then that's super serious. And improves sleep quality. And a lot of people have their daytime fatigue may be related in fact, back to either hot flashes, urinary problems, uh, being on these drugs alone. But we know that it, it, they can lead to sleep disturbance. It's, and of course, if they leave, leave the sleep disturbance, we're going to be fatigued and perhaps taking naps during the day. But if exercise reduces our fatigue improves our sleep, then we're going to be less fatigued during the day. And it may help maintain cognitive function. That's our, how we think about things, how we process information and so forth. It may help maintain some sexual interest. One paper out of Australia suggests that even. So get educated or get exercise. Now, where does this go? If you put all that together, I mean, Lauren and I and her advisor, who was the third main author on the ADT book, uh, uh, started to expand upon her thesis and develop an educational program. Our research in Canada has shown that many patients prefer to know about all these side effects ahead of time rather than be surprised by them, even when there may be only a small chance of experiencing them. Now, the, uh, let me go back to that. Um, so that falls out of the research. And one can, I think, defend the MDs. If they have only a half hour or 20 minutes to talk about the side effects, they're not going to bother to tell patients about the loss of body hair because it has no known medical effect, all right? But increasingly, we're realizing that in the combination, when we go on to the drug combinations with, uh, say, uh, abiraterone, uh, or uh, that's Itiga, or, uh, sorry, these things are automatically delivering the slides to me, um, that the, these side effects are even more intensified. So we can improve survival with uh, drug combinations, but the drug combinations have, be more, have even more side effects. So patients really need to get educated. And therefore, we developed the ADT educational program for patients starting on ADT and their partners or other family members. And this program has simply two parts. There's a class and there's a book. So the ADT uh, program, the educational program, as I say, includes a class and a book. The book was first published in North America in 2014, and the new third edition has just been published. And the program also has a single professionally facilitated, that's a, that is people like Lauren Walker with, with you know, psychology professional credentials will run these classes for us or, or, or urological nurses and so forth. And it's an hour and a half class now since COVID and a little bit before that, we started offering it online. We offer them monthly. And the classes offered as well is in-person classes at a few major centers in Canada. So that's a link to them if one wants to know about signing up for them. It is www.simplylifeonadt.com. And it tells you about the program in much greater detail than I'm mentioning here. Um, and we, we, I want to say why we're promoting the program is not because we're just trying to sell the program. But what happens is we have so many patients who want to come and take the program two years after they got the side effects. They, they got on the drugs. They figured, I'll worry about the side effects. Well, if they're already diabetic and they're already overweight and they're at increased cardiac risk, it becomes much more difficult. So this is a general information that every patient can know. If you're starting these drugs, don't wait to get the side effects. Get educated now. All right. Now, the book, we're really sort of pleased about this. The, the third edition just came out. Um, I, even, Lauren and I have not even got our own copies. 
um, but it's a much updated book. And it talks about the interaction of these drugs that expands upon the side effects. And our information in there is evidence-based, uh, which is really important uh, for us to get a, a formal endorsement for the program and for the book. Core to the educational program are the classes that I've already mentioned for patients starting in ADT and their partners and other loved ones. And these are offered once a month for free across Canada. And we are now piloting classes in Europe. We just had a review with our colleagues in Europe uh, two, uh, two hours ago. Um, and it's offered in the four cities in the UK. And the part program is now being supported by Prostate Cancer UK, where they have nurses who can help run the program in the UK. And we have the funding in place to roll the program out in a few veterans administration hospitals in the USA. So the program is expanding. Well, we, we Lauren and I, manage the Canadian program and run it. So there's a cover of the new edition of the book. And, what, and the book covers how ADT works, how to monitor side effects, physiological side effects, exercise, nutrition, sexual changes, impact on relationships beyond just sex, and self-management strategies. And if you look at the bottom there, it's endorsed by the Canadian Urologic Association and the European Association of Urology. And that sounds easy to say, but it wasn't simply endorsed. They had committees that reviewed it and MDs that reviewed it and panels that reviewed it. We got feedback. We had a spreadsheet from like 14 different doctors saying, here's the changes you need to make to get the endorsement. So this is we're proud of that, but it took a heck of a lot of work. And there's the cover of the book. And we're not trying to necessarily sell the book. We're trying to encourage patients who are starting these drugs to take the class. We take the class to get the book for free. So here are 10 points just to summarize all that I have said. Uh, one, under four groups I have, uh, approximately half of all prostate cancer patients will be on ADT at one time or another. But ADT has a lot of side effects, some of which are bothersome, but not necessarily medically serious, hot flashes perhaps. Others may not be obvious, like the risk of diabetes or a heart attack, but can be life-threatening if not properly managed. ADT is increasingly used with additional therapies such as the arches and or, chemo and or chemotherapy. And these combinations intensify the side effects and thus they need to be uh, carefully managed even more carefully than just the ADT alone. And some ADT side effects such as metabolic syndrome, which is a whole suite of things that all can increase the risk of heart disease and diabetes, they need to be managed almost, they have to be managed medically essentially with blood tests and so forth to be watching the risks. And they're particularly a uh, concern with the combinations of the basic ADT and the art is added in. In addition, ADT increases the risk of weaker bones and breaking a bone if one falls. Such outcomes are serious and hard to reverse once they set in. So the patient's got a broken hip. I mean, it's a little late to tell him to go to the gym. So this is why this, there's a timeliness about this. Okay. Uh, now, and I took the next sort of group, I, I divided it at the beginning to like four different groups. So. Third group of concern is the best way to deal with ADT side effects is to be aware of them before getting them and taking preventive action to reduce the more bothersome and medically serious side effects. So that's really the summary of the whole talk there um, without promoting our program. But the single best established preventative action to minimize ADT side effects is physical exercise. But I mean, obviously, some of these things have other risks. In fact, so patients who are starting these drugs do need proper cardiac assessment, if they break and broken bones already, they need to have their bone density assessed and so forth. So there's a lot to be managed here when starting on these drugs. ADT typically affects patients' mood, energy level, and sex drive. Those changes impact not just patients, but indirectly also their partners and the others they live with. So that's why the program needs to serve not just patients, but, but others the other, that they're close to. Open communication with those close to us about how ADT is affecting us can be helpful for both us and our loved ones for maintaining good quality of life when we are on ADT, for both of us, for them. Because if we're getting grumpy, uh, we don't want to talk to our partner, we're not helping our partner, so we have to be worried about their health as well as ours. Many of the ADT side effects can be managed, but that takes effort on our behalf and willingness to get to the gym, talk about it, talk about it, know the side effects, and openly communicate with others how we're feeling and, and what's going on. That is to be able to communicate. Or going into our shell because we don't feel like ourselves not wanting to talk about it. Anybody isn't helping anybody, not even us. So where do you start? 
Any patients in Canada starting an ADT can take the free one and a half hour professionally facilitated online ADT class to learn how to best manage ADT side effects. And lastly, there's a link to it. And those who take the class also get the ADT book for free. And there you have it. I am on time and I am free to take questions. I hope Lauren is unmuted. And I want to put up, whoops, I want to put up uh, a thank you to the European Association of Urology, the Canadian Urologic Association, and Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness, which is the organization in the US that is working with us to, to expand the program to uh, be able to serve folks in the uh, US. So we have a lot of colleagues who have helped us in the book. A lot of them have drafted chapters. There's a lot of names on the cover. Oops, sorry. Uh, but these are primary people here. Uh, co-leads, John Robinson was Lauren's uh, major professor. Eric Wabo has been a long-term collaborator of mine. Carly Sears, Hannah uh, Stremick helped us revise editions of the book uh, along the way. And uh, I don't know when I, how long I'll be able to handle this, but I give out my email address if people have questions about life on ADT of a, of a you know, side effect na nature, uh, they can contact me. If they're psychological, I might refer them to Lauren. If Lauren gets questions about you know, uh, drugs, she might refer them to me. But you can always uh, go to our website. Uh, our, there's a website email address uh, for registering for the classes and so forth. So that's it. So thank you both uh, for being here today. And thank you, Richard, for the presentation. And thank you, Lauren, for staying for the Q&A.